Welcome back to our exploration of the life and work of Le Corbusier. In this fourth episode, we delve deeper into the legacy and influence of this visionary architect. Join us as we uncover more about his groundbreaking designs, architectural innovations, and enduring impact on the world of architecture. Now let's continue with the next episode when Le Corbusier summarized his ideas about villas with this drawing, comparing the first house, the lake house, with the Stein house, and finally, the Ville Savoy, explaining the characteristics of each. However, our focus now shifts to the next stage, and we must bid farewell with his only surrealist work, which was the rooftop he designed for Mr. Bystegui, as seen here, features an absurd grassy patch atop a Parisian rooftop. There's even a fake chimney opening, all to create the illusion of the Arc de Triomphe, or the Eiffel Tower appearing to sit atop the chimney. It's a strange and singular work that demonstrates not a reconciliation with surrealists. Le Corbusier was always their adversary, but rather that the irrational, the instinctive, the unexpected, was beginning to crack his rational vision of the world and architecture. However, when they gather at Siraz in 1928 to establish the International Congresses of Modern Architecture, CIM, everyone has functionalism and rationalism as their guiding principles. Here they are, all gathered at a Swiss castle to found the CIM, and you'll notice a Spanish architect in the foreground, Mercadano, who played a significant role in introducing foreign ideas to Spain. Later, we'll see him briefly appear with Le Corbusier in a couple of episodes. After the establishment of CIM, which aimed to disseminate their ideas and convince the world of the need for more rational and functional cities, Le Corbusier asserts that this can only be achieved through major commissions. He relentlessly pursues such commissions, desperate for a significant project. First, there's the League of Nations in Geneva, the predecessor to today's United Nations. Le Corbusier tries to secure a commission to design its headquarters, believing for a long time that he has the project in the bag. However, it turns out to be a huge disappointment as he's ultimately passed over for the commission. Shortly after, he muses, if the League of Nations doesn't want me, perhaps Russia does. So he goes there and designs the Central Soyuz building, which would eventually be built but not exactly according to his plans, and especially not the way he wanted it to be. So he goes there and designs the Centro Soyuz building, which would eventually be built but not exactly according to his plans, and especially not the way he wanted it to be. This was the Palace of the Soviets project, and it was a gigantic undertaking. Le Corbusier spent a great deal of time in Russia, trying to realize his dream of creating the Grand Palace of the Soviets. Throughout his life, he desperately sought his Louis XIV, referring to a powerful patron or leader who could support his grand visions, much like the relationship between Louis XIV and his minister, Colbert. He searched for this patron in various figures, including Stalin, Mussolini, to whom he sent his books, and later, Marshal Pétain. However, he never found the ideal patron until the end of his life, when he found support from figures like Pandit Nehru in India. Despite his efforts, the projects in Russia ended in disappointment, but he eventually managed to realize two large buildings in Paris. One was the Cité de Refuge, housing for the Salvation Army and the other was the Saint-Marie-de-la-Tourette Monastery. And the other was the Swiss Pavilion at the Cité Internationale Universitaire. These were significant buildings, but they lacked the symbolic centrality that he had desired. The League of Nations headquarters, the Soviet palace in Moscow, none of these had the prominence he sought. He aimed to create the most important buildings of his time. Merely being the Swiss pavilion at the university campus wasn't enough. So he embarked on journeys to seek clients, to spread the good news like a prophet of the new architecture, but above all, to try to secure major commissions. One of the first was 
He is invited to Madrid and Barcelona by the Residencia de Estudiantes. He comes to Madrid to give lectures. As seen here, Mercadal takes him to visit El Escorial. This is where he launches the Convalescientes Gallery. Later, in Barcelona, he also has much success with major lectures. The newspapers cover him extensively. Then he establishes a relationship with Barcelona that would have a very long development, as in all his trips. So he frequents and sketches the women of the Chinatown neighborhood, and his influence would even reach President Messia. Here, we see him proposing a plan, collaborating alongside Gropius, as you can see. Corbusier is seen here with Massia alongside Gropius, and also two Spaniards, the aforementioned Mercadal, whom we've seen before, and José Luis Hertz, his main disciple and the one who would become, so to speak, the official Corbusian figure in Spain and later as the Dean of Harvard in the United States. After Spain, he headed to America, the New World, Buenos Aires, where he announced his books, promoting an architecture that he referred to as the gospel of the new architecture. Simultaneously, his lectures in Buenos Aires were sensational. He convinced them that Buenos Aires was undoubtedly more important than New York and couldn't afford to lag behind. However, this required undertaking the projects he proposed. His lectures were remarkable. He would draw on large sheets of paper while speaking, and as each one was completed, they were hung on a line across the stage, allowing the audience to see everything he had said during the lecture. He would then use these drawings for his books, resulting in significant success, as many of these books were based on the live drawings from his lectures. After Buenos Aires, he visited Sao Paulo and finally Rio de Janeiro. The proposals were very similar, always aiming towards Rio. But how could it be otherwise? Rio doesn't think small. You think small. Rio, with its sugarloaf mountain and bay, calls for a building several kilometers long on stilts, avoiding the unhygienic organization it currently has. He always proposed colossal, gigantic plans. He drew, as always, the women from his travels with that preoccupation, that fascination with women that would later make him see them as the source of all social energy, like those fertile bellies from which, in the end, the world is nourished. And a special woman, Josephine Baker, whom he meets. He had already seen her in the music halls of Paris, but he encounters her on the boat from Rio to Sao Paulo. They talk a bit, and later they arrange to travel back together on the same boat from Rio to Paris, quite a long journey. During this time, Le Corbusier draws her in many ways, with numerous sketches of Josephine Baker nude. She recounts in her memoirs that she performed for him. Here you see Le Corbusier on the boat with Josephine Baker and Pepito Abatino, the manager, and it must be said, the nominal husband of Josephine Baker. And yet, she attended the parties on the boat with Le Corbusier. She, as you know, was a volcano on stage, with a primitive energy that fascinated him. He'd say she was a simple woman. He'd write to his mother about it. Everyone knew because he told everyone. So she immediately radiated her discoveries. In this case, you see Josephine Baker with her face painted white like a clown and Le Corbusier dressed as a pirate in black, a new fascination for him. Behind the veneer of civilization and rationality lies that primal pulse of sensuality. And then Algiers, of course. The fascination with Algiers, the Algerian women. And of course, the major commissions. The bus plan for Algiers, of which he made many versions. He thought he would get it. Tried so many times, but in the end, he didn't build anything there, despite many attempts. So many trips trying to secure commissions. And the last one before the war, the United States in 1935, where... As American newspapers said, the Frenchman found American skyscrapers too small. In the United States, the first thing he says in New York is, very small, aren't they? You don't think big. You need to hire me to think big. And there he meets Margareta Harris again, 
the Swedish heiress divorced from an American who was his great American friend. As I mentioned earlier, they had corresponded before, and he saw her again there, as he had seen her before at BPI, with whom he would have this intermittent romantic relationship for so many years. Very interesting, Le Corbusier's relationship with women. However, not long after. In 1927, Le Corbusier, then married to Yvonne, wanted to gift a mural to Aileen Gray, a renowned designer and the wife of Badovici, a successful architecture publisher. They stayed in Gray's house in Lingri for the summer, a famous architectural work from 1927. While there, Le Corbusier painted this mural as a gift, depicted here naked, painting a part of the mural. He had a large scar from an accident with a boat propeller as he was an avid swimmer who spent summers swimming in the Mediterranean. This accident is evident in this photo taken while he was working on the mural. However, the mural turned out to be a disaster because Aylin Gray claimed that he had symbolically violated her. He was already over 60 years old and thought this would be his masterpiece. He finds out that he lent his house and it was ruined. Of course, he did it as a gift, and Marovici liked it. Then, years later, through correspondence, seeing how to take care of it, how to protect it, etc. But Ingrid withdrew her greeting and considered him an enemy from then on, becoming, in fact, a real one. So, their entire friendship ended. But in Europe, while these things were happening in private, in the public sphere, much more terrible things were occurring. We were witnessing the rise of fascism and also the preludes of World War II. In 1937, the Paris Exhibition was held, a very important exhibition for many reasons. It was significant because the two emerging totalitarian regimes symbolically confronted each other with their pavilions. Here, you can see the German pavilion with the eagle, representing the Nazi state's classical aspirations. Facing it was the Soviet pavilion, featuring the masses holding the sickle and hammer, representing Soviet totalitarianism. The Nazi and Soviet totalitarianisms face off against each other. Next to them, almost unnoticed, was a small pavilion, the Spanish pavilion. Spain, a country at war in 1937, sought help from the international community with this pavilion designed by Sert, a disciple and friend of Corbusier. As you can see, it faced the Spanish people and featured a path leading to a star, a work by Alberto. Inside, in this large, partly open-air hall covered with awnings, was Picasso's Guernica, exhibited at the 1937 exposition. Le Corbusier creates the Pavilion of the New Times, depicted as a structure held together like a temporary scaffold with cables. In this Pavilion of the New Times, he exhibits his work and creates his grand murals. What he wanted to be a replica of Picasso's Guernica and exposes his idea of how the future of France should be organized within what was then his ideology, a sort of proto-fascist or quasi-fascist syndicalism. Suddenly, we find Le Corbusier, who, since the economic crisis of 1929, has lost faith in entrepreneurs and technocrats saving the world. Now he wants politicians to save it. He promotes this syndicalist party and is one of its activists. He writes this book that says, Cannons, Ammunition. No, thank you, he says. Housing, please. Always thinking that architecture could save the world. Then how ironic it is that barely the war breaks out in 1939 he receives his first public commission, an ammunition factory in Paris, which he never completed because the French lines quickly dissolved, and the Germans invaded half of France, while the other half had the Vichy government, led by Marshal Pétain. This marked the most ominous episode in Corbusier's biography. He moved to Vichy and spent 18 months trying to become the architect of collaborationist France, of fascist France. And here you see him, in the letters from Pétain's office, 
in the safe conducts they give him in occupied France to go to Vichy. Suddenly, he does things for them, promoting the Mugandan, a project for simple housing so that young people could build during those war years. And he publishes the Maison de l'Homme, which is a manifesto not only about how the world should be organized with the architect and engineer as the two reference points, but also about how the French state should be organized, a French state stemming from history and empire, fundamentally an attempt at ideological refoundation of France. We can say it was a misstep, a loss of reason, perhaps. Many didn't understand it. His cousin Pierre joined the resistance and couldn't comprehend that Le Corbusier would go to Vichy to try to work for Patin. Yet, his letters to his mother during these years are enthusiastic. He feels he's touching the sky with his hands, saying for the first time, I am close to power. For the first time, I believe I will realize my dreams because I have never been this close to the Louis XIV I had dreamed of and wanted to serve. However, all of this falls apart. He leaves Vichy, and as the French and Germans start facing setbacks in the war, the tide begins to turn. He retreats into his privacy as the war takes a different turn. From then on, he will no longer speak about politics. He invents the modulor, a proportional system. He even gives it a feminine version, as seen here, with a woman framed within Leonardo's circle, it's a proportional system that he believed could regenerate architecture, and suddenly, he returns after the war in 1945 to his beloved studio in Guilleville, abandoned and covered in dust. One might think that the life of the architect had ended here for many of the great and important architects who collaborated with the Nazis. Their careers were over, logically so. They went through denazification commissions, but miraculously, it wasn't the case for Le Corbusier. In 1945, everyone forgives him. His cousin Pierre, who had fought in the resistance, returns to work with him, as do his disciples. The ministers of reconstruction under de Gaulle ask him to collaborate with the country. Suddenly, his wartime actions are forgotten or forgiven, and Le Corbusier swiftly resumes his work on major commissions. The French government sends him as the French representative to the commission tasked with building the United Nations headquarters in New York, which is set to be the equivalent of what the League of Nations was in Geneva before the world's governing body. When he sees those around him, he believes he will secure the project. The project for the headquarters of the United Nations in New York. Despite his hopes and efforts, the project does not materialize as he had hoped. The design he had proposed is ultimately dismissed, and he feels frustrated to see his work copied by others, such as Wallace Harrison. It's another disappointment, another great work that he cannot realize. However, despite this setback, he manages to carry out another important work. His first major residential work, the Unité d'Habitation in Marseille, which he envisions as a vertical garden city. Each of the units, as seen here, is inserted into a large framework resembling a honeycomb, aiming to create a sense of community and provide all necessary amenities within the structure. The concept of the collective living space, those macro blocks he had drawn in the projects for Buenos Aires and in the bus plan for Algiers, he manages to realize, even if only partially, in Marseille, and he does so. Extraordinarily, Picasso asks for permission to visit him, and he rushes to guide Picasso. Here they are, Picasso and Le Corbusier, visiting the works of the housing unit, a project that ultimately comes to fruition. Impeccable, like a grand gesture of exaltation of the collective, because ultimately they are almost cells with double-height spaces but with interior streets. With a terrace, as you can see, with spaces different from what people were accustomed to inhabit, and with those double heights that were almost Corbusier's trademark. It has a usable terrace for children with a nursery that contains at the same time the exaltation of the collective and the presence of the irrational in this late Corbusier, 
where he has already ceased to believe in function, in reason, and believes in other things. And within this geometric landscape, you see how the unexpected begins to emerge, how that primitive world of rocks, fossils, and what he had once called the silent art now becomes a poetic reaction. Objects become imbued with poetic reaction, and this unexpected lyrical element begins to permeate his architecture. It's a world of the irrational, the unexpected, the lyrical, which threads through the final part of his career. These drawings of shells that I mentioned are now governing his work. The first of these works he undertakes is met with absolute horror by the architectural community. With Champ, a chapel atop a hill, he constructs forms that are difficult to reference to anything, expressionistic in nature, evoking a ship's hull, nun's wings, hooded towers. What was this? The old rationalist master had become irrational, pursuing almost the same ghosts as Mendelssohn in the 1920s. His colleagues, of course, criticize him, but they criticize him fiercely. They expel him from that holy of holies of modernity. He had done it for Father Coutinho, a Dominican, a very cultured man who wanted to modernize sacred art. And look at the inauguration ceremonies. This was a little later, but in what way did this new object impose itself on the world with such radicalism? Today, it is a place of pilgrimage, but not of religious pilgrimage as it had historically been, nor of architectural pilgrimage. It is surely the most well-known building of the 20th century, and yet it was received with absolute horror as an irrational stone in the building of reason. The great wall pierced by windows using the modulor, a proportional system he had invented trying to make sense of it all. And this is the interior image. Through the exploration of the sacred, he comes into contact with that primitive substance within himself. And shortly after, for the same client again, for Father Kutuge. Nearby, there's a monastery, La Tourette, which he reinterprets, inspired by the charter house of Ima he had seen on other trips, considering the conditions and rules that govern the lives of the monks. And he does it indeed with fragments that seem to be extracted from the unité d'habitation, nothing more than the cells, what he then called the béton brut, that is, the unfinished concrete with those rough textures very different from the houses of the 1920s, all perfectly smooth with their metal joinery marking the edges. Now, everything is rough, everything is tactile, everything speaks of other things, and yet it remains modern. It is indeed a cloister, but not a cloister one can walk through because it is a cloister on stilts. And then the chapel with the tubes that allow light to enter in a different way, it suddenly becomes a new architecture, an architecture of the old Corbusier that nobody can understand. Here he works with the architect and musician Xenakis, and they create undulations with these issues of proportion, trying to reconcile musical harmonies with the harmonies of the modulor. It is all a great symphonic poem, sometimes difficult to interpret, yet fascinating. The old Le Corbusier, the rationalist of the bench, and next to him, the emerging Le Corbusier, that Le Corbusier that comes, let's say, from the magma. And it's not just a Japanese quote, not just a reference to nature geometricized as an artificial rock. It speaks of what we cannot control because it's beyond us. And all of that he will be able to do at the end of his life. In Chandigarh, a new city, the partition between India and Pakistan had left the state of Punjab. The capital, Lahore, had fallen to Pakistan. A new capital had to be created because Indian Punjab had no capital. Pandit Nehru calls Le Corbusier. Well, he doesn't call him directly, but he calls Maxwell Fry and Jane Drew, among other architects. However, in the end, the architects turn to the master and bring him along. He travels to India and immerses himself in its culture. With Pandit Nehru, he discusses how it's going to be and outlines a new city, 
a new city where the focus is no longer, as it was before, on the technocrats he had thought would save the world in the 1920s, but on the democratic institutions that he ends up designing himself. In this plan of the capital, you can see the three large buildings that he would realize. It is the Palace of Justice, the Grand Assembly, and then the Secretariat, a functional building for offices, as the governor's palace was never built. The open hand, somewhat reminiscent of Picasso's dove, was intended to be a symbol of unity, of integration in a devastated country torn into pieces by the bloodshed of hundreds of thousands of people, murdered and massacred in the separation between Hindus and Muslims that led to the partition of Pakistan. Le Corbusier tried, but it didn't work either. Punjab has split again. Now, within these institutions that Le Corbusier created, there are several capitals. The six have revealed all that effort, Le Corbusier's attempt to govern the world through architecture. I believe Chandigarh expresses this very well while also manifesting his tremendous failure. However, the building... The buildings are colossal. For example, this one, the Palace of Justice, with the open hand in the background. And here's the photo of the completed building, which was the first one finished. Here you can see Le Corbusier inaugurating it with the dignitaries of India. In his letters to his mother during this time, he writes, Finally, I have done something worthwhile. I have finally reached my own king. Finally, I have found a political leader who has trusted me to create not only a new city, but also the representative buildings of the new city. And the most difficult part, how to create the palace of the assembly how to do it, how difficult it is to represent the new India. He explores this in many ways, trying different approaches. And finally, he finds the solution here, in the almost ventilation towers of the thermal plants. He says, let's give this a meaning. He takes an industrial form, as he had used before, the threads, the saw teeth, everything that came from the language of industry, and in this case, he transmutes it into a language that becomes the identity of a new country. And this was ultimately with the Secretariat building behind, the office building that somewhat resembles the United Nations, a more functional building. And in front, the assembly, with that kind of large truncated tower expressing, evoking also the Hindu observatories from the medieval period, expressing the desire for the new India to have its symbols. Only Chandigarh, like Brasilia, has been one of the two great capitals. The new capital of Brazil, which Niemeyer and Costa made, and this new city, this new capital of the Punjab state, made by Le Corbusier, were the two great efforts made by modern architects to confront the problem of the new city and give it a symbolic content, a content that transcends the functional. As a result of this, he got other commissions. He went to India a lot at that time. Of course, Nehru said to him, I'm going to commission the city, but you have to come and live here. He said, it's impossible. They negotiated, and he had to go only twice a month, two months a year, which meant he spent two months a year in India. And since he was in India, he got other commissions. Among them, there were commissions like those from Adampur, where he built the headquarters for the Association of Textile Workshop Owners, where he created a grand villa. With this late Corbusian language, which would be so imitated worldwide under the name of Baton Brut, and another smaller villa, where Le Corbusier suddenly becomes intimate and recovers his projects from the 1930s with Catalan vaults. And this image, where you have those interiors that are almost Franciscan, you know. Although always under the Catalan vault, a fresco by Le Corbusier. Then the Mediterranean, his love for the Mediterranean, his beloved Mediterranean. He would try to do it more times, like the project of Rocky Rob, or later in Paris with the houses Yaoul where he would again explore this world, which even becomes chromatically exuberant, Le Corbusier. 
From the mechanical purity of the white villas, he has suddenly become the eco-corbusier with rough textures and vibrant colors. This is the color chart they had to use to paint the houses in Yaoul. As you can see in this period photo, Le Corbusier finds himself completely segregated from his colleagues. They cannot understand how that architect who used to create machines for living like all of us had suddenly embarked on this path of chromatic boldness and a desire to achieve, through textures and tactility, a different architecture, distant from rationality and closer to the emotional. During nearly ten years, he creates his poem of the right angle because, yes, he remained a rationalist, and the right angle was fundamental for him. But notice how he interprets the right angle through a composition of images. These are the images you see here, almost like small paintings or engravings he creates where the presence has certain elements of his modulor, but alongside that the presence of woman is obsessive. The woman, you know, the primal Eve, the woman as the substrate that sustains the fabric of the world in which he lives. Alongside this desire to go back to primitive origins, he continues to explore things. With the Brussels pavilion he made for Phillips, the electronic poem with these arranged surfaces, who could think that this was from Corbusier, right? Or sometimes like the one for Heidi Baber in Zurich, you know, metallic, but the inclusion was all concrete, right? No, not only that, but also in other instances. In making tributes to himself, as in his only American work, the Carpenter Center at Harvard University in Queen Street, of course, there he had a good relationship first with Gropius, which was somewhat distant, but then with Sert as Dean, a staunch Corbusian with absolute discipline, and he builds, so to speak. These two large kidney-shaped structures, connected by a ramp that crosses them, form a promenade at the scale of the American campus. And he even leaves behind major projects unfinished, or rather unrealized, which would have left an extraordinary mark. Many others, like this hospital in Venice, remain in the realm of ideas. We stand before an audience with a hospital he designed for Venice, envisioned simply as a fabric, like a carpet. Everything that the Team X and the Mad Buildings would later pursue, the desire to create a woven architecture, originates from this unrealized project by Le Corbusier in Venice. He was already old and yet continued to inspire the younger generation. But for him, the only approval he sought was that of his mother, and he continued to write to her every week. Here is a drawing he made of his mother, Amélie, at 91 years old. She would live until 99, but in a very short period, both his wife, Yvonne, and Bon passed away, followed shortly by his mother. Le Corbusier suddenly felt orphaned when Yvonne died. After the cremation, they handed him the ashes, but the cremation was incomplete, and he extracted a bone from a cervical vertebra that hadn't burned. He kept it and always carried it in his pocket until he died, saying, This is what remains of Yvonne. When he was drawing, he would place it on the drawing board, and if he wasn't carrying it in his pocket, he would caress it. Le Corbusier, in his final days, was in a different territory from that of the rationalist reformer of his early days. He built a cabin by the sea, a large cabin where he lived. It was a simple cabin, just two meters by two, made of logs. Next to it, in a construction hut, he had his studio. Here you have the construction hut, one day during the summer. Of 1965, he declined on August 27th at 8 in the morning, Chastard Wall Yaganyeg, also known as Le Corbusier. He descended from the cabin towards the Mediterranean Sea. He removed his clothes and ventured into the sea. There, he would meet his death a few days later. Despite grand eulogies, speeches, honor guards, and processions, he had wished for his remains to be buried by the Mediterranean, and so they were. Later, his disciples brought his remains and mixed them with a handful of soil from the Acropolis and a vessel of water from the Ganges, placing them in a tomb facing the sea. 
The 78 years between his birth in La Chaux de Fonds and his death in the Mediterranean were for him a journey of knowledge, transitioning from fundamentalist dogmatism to the realm of emotions, from geometry to the world of seashells and artificial stones that adorned his works. Ultimately, he moved from certainties to emotions, from ideas to forms, and from the snow to the sea. In conclusion, Le Corbusier's life and work epitomize a transition from the strict confines of geometry to the boundless realm of emotions, from abstract ideas to tangible forms, and from the snowy peaks to the tranquil sea. His enduring legacy continues to inspire architects and designers worldwide, urging us to push the boundaries of creativity and innovation in our built environment. Thank you for joining us on this enlightening journey through the remarkable life of one of the most influential architects of the 20th century. If you enjoyed this content and want to keep exploring more about architecture and design, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel to stay updated on all our upcoming releases. Click the subscribe button and join our community of design enthusiasts. Together, we'll continue exploring the fascinating world of architecture and beyond. Thank you for your support.